Welcome everyone. Um, I am Dr. Megan Clark. I am an associate professor of moral theology at St. John's University and the faculty co-chair of our St. John's CRS Global Campus Committee. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome everyone for a discussion on global vaccine access, a conversation about global health equity. As is always our custom, I, we will begin with prayer and then I will introduce um, our speakers and our, our conversation today. For those who are um, joining us, we will have time for questions from the audience. You just use the chat function and we'll be able to see and I will try and get to as many of your questions as possible. This rec uh, the recording of this event will go up on our YouTube channel, which um, has all of our events oh, during the pandemic. And so please um, share the recording with others who were not able to be here today, as well as take a look at our other events. Almighty God, help us this day to direct our attention and concern to the poor and the sick within our one human family. Both near and far, let us hear their hopes and their struggles. Help us to respond in an effort to restore their faith and their belief in their human dignity and flourishing and that they matter to the rest of the world. May we find within ourselves the conviction to always put those without power foremost in our hearts and minds. Let us so live that all who know us may know that you are a God who cares and when they, when they experience our care and concern. Let us draw strength from each other as we work together for global health equity during this pandemic and beyond. Amen. We have a truly esteemed panel with us today to talk about global vaccine access and global health equity. Father Stanislaw Alla is a Jesuit priest serving as an associate professor at Vidya Yoti College of Theology in Delhi, India. He obtained his licentiate in moral theology from the Alfonsanium in Rome and a PhD in theological ethics from Boston College. Along with teaching different subjects related to moral theology in Delhi, he lectures at other theology centers like Santa Sevre in Paris. He has published in national and international journals and his paper on public health concerns in India, an overview was presented I was going to say recently, but pre pandemic at Boston College in the USA. Sister Carol Kean is a daughter of charity of St. Vincent de Paul. She has a BS in nursing, magna cum laude, and a master's in healthcare finance from the University of South Carolina. She has over 50 years' experience in healthcare, first as a nurse and nurse manager, and then 18 years as a hospital CEO in two hospitals. And finally, 14 years as president and chief executive officer of the Catholic Health Association in the United States. She retired from that position in June 2019. Also within there, she spent some time on our St. John's University board. She currently serves as the head of the health task force of the Vatican's COVID-19 commission. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and played a central role in advancing the Affordable Care Act. She has served on many boards in healthcare, education, and insurance. She's received 11 honorary doctorates and many awards. Finally, we have Kate Oswald, the Chief Policy and Partnership Officer from Partners in Health. Kate leads a team with a mandate to drive global strategy for Partners in Health's policy, advocacy, government accompaniment, and internet institutional partnerships efforts. By working hand in hand with PIH's global leaders to strengthen the efforts of local, district, and national governments, 
Her team is redefining how high quality healthcare is governed and delivered globally. Kate is a passionate advocate for universal healthcare, social justice, and global health equity, which her previous 14 years of work in Haiti and Liberia with Partners in Health have greatly informed. She earned her MPH in epidemiology and program design and a bachelor's in international development from Brown University. And for the past 16 years has served as a course leader and instructor in Brown University's Leadership Institute Global Health Program. So I, I am so honored and, and glad to have this panel together. Um, all three of you work um, in areas and for organizations and with backgrounds that um, just are very close to, to my heart personally. And so we are, we are truly lucky to have you with us today. This panel came about because of a recognition um, that what we are seeing and what we are experiencing in terms of conversations about access to vaccines and a pathway out of being kind of the pandemic as our central focus in the United States is very often radically different from what the COVID reality is outside. Um, According to the World Health Organization's most current dashboard, there are 531,156 new COVID cases in the last 24 hours. Over 265 million cases total, over 5.25 million deaths. 7.9 billion vaccine doses have been administered but 73% of those shots or jabs have been in high or upper middle class countries. Only 11% as of this week of Sub-Saharan Africa has had access to one dose. And while in the US we've experienced versions of stay at home orders and restrictions, that is often nothing like the lockdowns experienced in other countries, whether it be the UK and Italy or in the most extreme case, the Philippines, where people really were not allowed to leave their houses. Pope Francis has called for pharmaceutical companies to make a gesture of humanity and release the patents. But as we'll discuss in our time together today, such a request from a company in South Africa has still fallen on largely deaf to no response. It is also a time where when it comes to healthcare or all kind of aspects of our social reality, Pope Francis has also warned us that we have a choice. We will either come out of this pandemic and build a more inclusive and better global society in which the flourishing of all people is respected, or we will come out worse. Uh, it is a choice he wants uh, we, to us to have hope, but it is one that those are our only two options. This kind of just staying where we are isn't a real thing. And so as we, we start today, I'd like to begin by asking um, Sister Carol to tell us a little bit about her work with the Vatican Commission. In response to the pandemic, Pope Francis and the Vatican set up the COVID-19 Commission. We are lucky to have the leader of the health task force with us. Can you tell us a little bit about the commission and the work that the health task force is doing in order to work on access and health equity? Megan, thank you very much and thank you for having me. It's always a joy to be back on St. John's campus, even if it's only virtually. Um, I, I would say that um, the Holy Father had a, a very real concern in it. Those who have read his encyclical Fratelli Tutti would say he was writing Fratelli Tutti when the pandemic was just hitting. And he talked about the fact that um, what you talked about, um, we have choices, but these are choices we have to concretely make. Will we make our world better? And so while often you could think of a pandemic simply as health, but as we've learned over this last year and a half, 
economics, security, um, ecology have all had uh, and imp been impacted by the pandemic. And so he wanted to see what the church could contribute to helping the world get out of this better and not try to, to think, and as he put it, that what we really need to do is just get back to the old normal. The old normal was not good enough. And so he set up a, a task force in ecology, economy, security, and health. Um, I had the honor of chair, I have the honor of chairing that uh, Vatican uh, task force. And um, probably later on, as we talk through this, I'll be able to give you some idea of how we have used that task force to go after um, equity in vaccines and equ equity in treatment. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of simplistic solutions that people put out. Well, just donate all the vaccines. Donate a vaccine for everyone you give. Donate one to the, to the country. Many of the places that we're talking about don't have the infrastructure uh, to be able to do it. Many of them have huge, uh, huge numbers of people who have absolutely no trust in it and, and, and no willingness to take it. So um, there are a lot of things you have to do that are, and, and you know, to say, well, just take the simplistic way of uh, give me more vaccines uh, is just not the way we had to go at this. And, and so, and we also wanted to go at it in a way that we looked at the other areas, the ecology, the economy, and um, security. Because as you know, in many of these countries that we're talking about, it's not even safe to come to the health facility. In many of these countries, the church is not allowed to operate a health facility. And so what we wanted to do was, was to establish something that would look comprehensively, but also look at how the church, with its unique set of resources, it's not the wealthiest institution, but in the in terms of networks and networks of people that are trusted in many countries more than as one one very top scientist said to me, sister, you can put the best virologist in the world in the room with some of these people. You can put the highest government official and they will not pay attention. They need someone who's been with them before COVID during COVID and will be with them after. And in many cases, that's the sisters. So um, as we go along, I would like to explain more about how the health task force works, but that's a, that's a little picture of Pope Francis's um, vision for starting. You know, he, he talks about coming out of the COVID um, in his Fratelli Tucci because he uses the Good Samaritan. And he says that the goal is to widen our circle of people we consider neighbors to ourselves and in widening it, that these people don't all look like us, think like us, speak the same language, have the same religion. And so it was his effort to have the church play a major role. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it, I mean, it leads in so beautifully to, to turning to Kate. Um, Partners in Health is is structured with the preferential option for the poor and accompaniment at the center of of its its mission and its way of going about building healthcare systems and delivering healthcare. You work in twelve countries, truly leading many of the conversations on global health equity and delivery of quality healthcare to the poor. Can you share a little bit with us about how Partners in Health has been? responding to the pandemic. Sure, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with this esteemed panel. I can't wait to learn more from Sister Carol and um, Father Stan as well. And so, yes, I have had the, the great pleasure of kind of seeing what we mean by living the preferential option for the poor and the daily work that, that I have done over the last 17 years with Partners in Health. And, you know, I, here we are finding ourselves in year three of this global pandemic. And, um, you know, I think back to uh, February of last of, of 2020, when we were all still traveling, concerned that um, 
you know, cases were spreading, but we were hearing from our colleagues uh, who were closer to some of the efforts and um, the, the WHO conversations that we needed to be doing more quicker. And, uh, you know, as a human rights focused organization and as one that had, you know, really found its founding in in, in um, infectious diseases, we knew that it was going to require an all of society approach to truly uh, stop the spread of of this global of this pandemic. And sure enough, here we are. Um, and recognizing the impact, as 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 Sister Carol said, on you know the economy and and security. And so from beginning, you know our our. We know that in order to gain trust and to be able to truly live out that preferential option for the poor, it's it's most essential to work with those who are in community and, and living daily. And so the community health workers, the network of 19,000 workers across the countries where we work, were trained up on what is COVID, why, how is it different from tuberculosis and other respiratory illnesses? How do we protect ourselves and our communities? So it's really focused on what's this toolkit that we need to have? Because everything we do, if you're taking a human or a family-centered approach, is that it's not just the disease, but it's everything around you that's impacting your ability. So your school's going to be impacted. Your ability, if you have to quarantine, you know, how are you going to, or if you're a daily worker who has to work in a marketplace, how are you going to provide for your family if you're being forced in a, into a lockdown situation? So we were thinking about all of these aspects from day one and really working on what is this comprehensive package of you know, masking, social distancing, but also also the social supports necessary to be able to safely isolate and quarantine. If you're taking in health equity lens, you have to be saying, okay, yeah, it might be easy for me to safely isolate and quarantine because I live by myself and, you know, in a, in a, in a apartment where I can easily do that. And I have a job that allows me to continue to make resources to support my family safely from afar. But what about the billions of people that depend on, um, you know, frontline type work to be able to do that? So all of these things went into our planning. And, uh, you know, in each of the countries, whether it was Mexico or Peru, sadly, Peru has had the highest death rate in the world from COVID, despite being, you know, a, a country that has had access to vaccines. Um, but because of social stratus, you know, the differences between those who have and have not, we've seen huge um, disparities in who's getting sick and who's dying. Um, whether it's the prisons in, uh, in Russia or Kazakhstan, where we had been working with tuberculosis patients for many years, or in some in Haiti, where you know, in the midst of every all of these these global challenges, there's also huge political and security um, uh, challenges. So all of these things were were taken into effect as we mobilized the existing teams to add more work to their already challenging um, jobs, and so. We, we decided that we needed to really emphasize the need for reinforcing existing health structures. There's this whole debate about whether, you know, we need to, we do, we need to invest more. Don't get me wrong. We need to, as a global society, we need to invest more in our people and the welfare of our people. But at the same time, we need to be recognizing that, um, you know, diseases are not happening at random and that if we're going to be taking that human centered approach, we have to be investing in people and in the facilities that are needed to be able to treat any disease, whether it's HIV or a non communicable disease like cancer and then add COVID to that. Um, and so, for instance, in Lesotho, we were able to quickly um, add a new facility on top of the National Drug Resistant Tuberculosis Hospital to set up the national COVID treatment centers and provide oxygen for the country. Um, we were pulled into responding to the US 
COVID crisis. We never imagined that we would find ourselves taking lessons learned from Rwanda and Lesotho and Malawi and Mexico and Haiti and bringing them back to this country that is extremely well resourced, but had disinvested in the social structures and the, you know, that, that you know, investment in supporting each other as neighbors and people. And so public health had been disinvested in while we really focused on kind of the sick care system and privatized medicine. So we've now managed for the last you know, 15, eight, I guess it's been 19 months now, um, the contact tracing for the state of Massachusetts and then engaged in 17 other jurisdictions around the US. In Immokalee, Florida, we're running the, um, you know, the, the COVID task force and community health worker programs there and now doing, you know, lots of vaccine outreach or in North Carolina where, um, you know, the community health workforce has now been solidified as a, an, um, a, a statewide program because they've recognized that in order to truly end this, um, this, this pandemic, we're going to have to really reinvest. So we've really jumped in full force and using, you know, all the tools in the toolkit, but also really um, pushing on the advocacy side to, to promote um, the, the values that you know, you, we're going to be discussing more today. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, in New York was among the first really hard hit in in the U.S. during the the pand when it started, and yeah, now three years from now. Um, and I, he is a very controversial man, and um, but the I shudder to think what would have happened if when Mayor Bill de Blasio took office, his predecessor, Mayor Bloomberg, had wanted and started a plan to offload and close the public hospitals in New York City, um, that the HNH system was considered not worth the money that it was costing in order to have. And I look at what, what spring 2020 would have looked like, and it was bad enough. But what that would have looked like in New York City if we did not have a public hospital system at all anymore. It and it's underfunded and it's under-resourced. And you know, I, I live in Rockaway, Queens, which is one of those places that is a health desert. And there constantly is fights about whether or not it's worth to keep St. John's H and H hospital on the peninsula. And yet it's the only healthcare that a largely African American low income community can access. Um, and it was full and overloaded during um, spring of 2020. If we hadn't had that, um, I, I think oftentimes people don't realize what, how much worse COVID would have been if we hadn't had the resources that, that were there and the places to expand from. Um, another place that has been terribly hit is, is India. Um, when I looked up the data, India is third after the United States and, and Brazil in reported WHO deaths from, from COVID-19. And it's a, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated place for a host of reasons. It's one where I think Sister Carol's point, from what I've known from Father Stan and from others that I've met over the years in work, um, it's one place where the the church and sisters and and people like you, Father Stan, do have some moral credibility because of commitment to to healthcare institutions for the poor. But it's also um, terribly complicated politically, socially. So as a, a, a bioethicist and theologian based out of Delhi, Father Sin, um, can you share a little bit about the situation in India, about your experience um, and what is going on on the ground there, which may or may not match up with what gets kind of reported back to, to us in the global press? Thank you, Megan, for having me, and it's wonderful to join uh, Sister Carol and Kate and all the others. It's wonderful to be there. Yes, 
on April 21st, I took a flight to Hyderabad and then on the fifth day, I was just taking care of myself on the fifth day, I, I had this unusual cough. So by evening, I, I came to know that uh, the test that I have had positive. So, and then the next one week to 10 days, I simply couldn't leave my room. The food was coming to the door and I had to wash my plate and I had to take care of my clothes. And uh, so simply, and it was on the fifth floor of my niece's house, my brother's family. So I couldn't go out anywhere. I, I, I was walking in my room. So it was simply suffocating, uh, breathless. So it was gasping like, you know, though I had a bed and a room and a attached bathroom, but that was a very, very, and that was the experience of millions of people in India. Statistics are very, very, very complicated. Uh, many, many studies uh, find, found out uh, that they're, not, they're simply false because uh, uh, when you look at the death certificates issued by the municipalities, it's four or five times more than usually within that range. So, if half a million people are the reported dead now in India, it could be many, many more, several, several times more, in fact. That's the thing. Lots of studies are done already on that. So, we have to really properly mourn the dead. That's, I think, a ritual that we should really go through honestly. One of the member in the parliament himself said, we, let me at least mourn the dead, really. Let's forget about all these political differences. So, uh, if you are to look at the... And joys and hopes and griefs and anxieties that Gaudiya may spare. If you look at the negatives first, uh, it was a devastating experience for millions and millions. Perhaps everyone lost someone in the family or someone who is very close, uh, dear and dear one. And then there is so much of anger and the failure at the systems and, and the lack of communication. Uh, the, the piercing thing that we could have saved many, many people. It's not just because he was uh, he had other comorbidities or he was a very critical situation. If we had a better infrastructure, we would have uh, we would have saved many many more. So he would have survived or she would have survived. If only we had a oxygen. If only we had an ambulance. Ambulances were waiting, piling up outside the hospitals for hours and perhaps uh, many many hours. Simply there was no place inside. So just because there was no bed and many, many beds had two, three patients, if I imagine, like many, many people have two uh, on a bed. So like this kind of thing. And the high, uh, the, the hospital bills were simply skyrocketing uh, 10 times more for a bed. Everyone was making money. There are many people who said, I, I cleared all my debts and I made uh, many, many times more. It was a huge profit making time for those people. It's, it's shocking, like, you know, how people abused the situations. And then those those images of the all those floating dead bodies on the Ganges, and then the fires burning 24 hours, and they were just uh, rotating. So negatively, there were so many things that uh, that systemic failure of ourselves and uh, making uh, unable to make things accessible to the people. But on the other hand, and the cultural factors, simply India was exposed. The multi-dimensional, yeah, the many Indians were exposed. There were many, many Indians, like, you know, you have the rural and urban by uh, divided by class, caste, religion, gender, and then all kinds of disparities were uh, exposed. So in a way that uh, simply showed us who we are uh, in a way, and then we have to do a lot more. Positively, uh, that was a wonderful experience to know our resilience and solidarity, people took care of each other, and then um, the best of the people have come in that situation. And then we reached out to people and we took care of the people because if no one comes to visit me, when someone comes, it's such a touching experience. When someone calls you, calls you up and then someone visits you and the healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors and the scientists and those who are working um, uh, all the time and all these uh, pharma industries and all those trying uh, to reach out to people. So uh, both systems and structures and uh, institutions try to take care of people. We did build a lot of wonderful pharma industries and all that for the last 20, 30, 40 years. So they came to our rescue. But still, 70, 80% of the people have to uh, bear the expenses out of pocket. So in India, very, very few people have health insurances. Maybe 5, 10% of Indians would have a good health insurance. Otherwise, so again, that uh, and uh, about 60 million people simply uh, slip into poverty because of the medical expenses. In the normal times, 
now this time it will be more 60 million simply slip into poverty from lower middle class or middle class because simply they have to pay and they have to travel long distance and so and again culturally superstitions played their role and lack of information lack of access and these inhibitions and then hesitancy uh, a few a few days ago i read in nagaland on the one state where the bordering myanmar uh, about a very very small percentage of them got because they said you will become monkey in two 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 months two months and then you will you will as he said you will become a crocodile so if you take it you will become a monkey and you will die in two years so still most of the tribals do not uh, accept it so these are very powerful imageries so the the mythology the superstition and then all these kinds of uh, uh, the stories the impact on the people is uh, uh, fascinating in a way but it it blocks uh, the whole uh, vaccine processes and how to make them available to the people so uh, it, uh, thank god finally we are able to breathe a little better and then uh, Omicron hasn't impacted as much. So, uh, but the, negatively, it was a devastating experience collectively. And then, uh, but again, positively, uh, we survived. So we survived and we can survive. And so that experience, uh, we will be able to, uh, we can come back and we can uh, build up again. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's a wonderful experience, but it's a very, very painful and then a, a sad experience for what we have gone through and taking care of the people. We have lost dozens and hundreds of priests and nuns. And then, as you mentioned about the healthcare, we are 1.5% Catholics in India. With Protestants, we are about 2.5% in Indian population. But we provide more than 25% of healthcare. 20-25% of healthcare is given, especially in the rural areas, by the Catholic Church, mostly. Uh, so in that sense, the services that the church personnel have provided is uh, exemplary. And it's uh, admirable, and then uh, so there is a real witness to what we do, and it has happened in this case. So it's wonderful to that we were able to do and reach out to people, and even the migrants, and then so all those who are invisible. So we are able to reach out to those invisible, the vulnerable people. Was a, it's a great opportunity to to help them. Um, taking from the the that point um of. You know the, I shake my head at the the example of the you know you'll turn into a crocodile, um, and and initially it kind of, um, you know should we pay more attention to the the kind of the comic book movies <laughs> that we are so fond of, um, that are so so popular, right? Because that right like this idea of all of these kind of science experiments go wrong that that turn people into, you know, superheroes or super villains. Um, but at the same time, it's not radically different than some of the outlandish conspiracy theory stories that have come about in the United States, uh, you know, about microchips and mind control that it will come through um, through the vaccines. And so that seems like a good um, and you know this, as I said at the be before we began, this wasn't a question that I had put in when I sent you a bunch of questions to think about. Um, but more and more, um, I want to ask each of you what what is the prevalence that you're seeing of the vaccine hesitancy and the misinformation, and what, if anything, are you finding that? is successful in combating it um because as you know as sister carol noted at the very beginning you know the world health organization can say what it wants it can issue press release after press release i mean that press release is irrelevant to somebody in far rockaway who doesn't think that the vaccine is safe to somebody in rural india who thinks that there's something fishy going on, you know, to somebody in a country in sub-Saharan Africa where they've got a long history of not being able to trust Westerners coming in with, you know, with medications and vaccines that are new. Um, so, so perhaps I'll, I'll start with, with sister Carol and then, and then Kate and back to father Stan. Uh, for for both, what are you seeing, and are you seeing anything from which we could take 
kind of some hope or strategies to to um, more effectively try and combat it? Um, I I um, got off the phone this morning with four groups of sisters from four African countries, um, which um, and what I had seen with them eight months ago to what I see now, it was a great reason for hope. We have a lot more work to do. Um, but one of the things we looked at in, the, in with the health um, and, uh, was that we had to go after equity in the vaccines. You know, that had to be an objective, even if there were lots and lots of Re, you know, good excuses and bad excuses for um, not spreading them out evenly at first. But we also knew that there was the worst thing that could happen was to get COVAX to donate huge numbers of vaccines to a country to have them expire because nobody would take them. And so the first thing we built, and, and as you know, Megan, as a theologian, and Father Stan and, and probably Kate, the church sometimes doesn't do science as well as it could. And so we have a history at times of people um, speaking very negatively about vaccines. We have a, a history of them in misinterpreting. Um, we do know that many of the vaccines every one of us has taken has some relationship to a stem cell line from one aborted fetus in the 1960s, okay? Either the testing or the manufacturer. Um, some of what we hear out there in certain circles would be everybody that gets a vaccine has another baby has been aborted to give them that vaccine. That is terribly, to people with a conscience, that is terribly difficult. So we had to get good theology that was written not only at the level of people like the parish priest and the bishop, <clears throat> um, but also theology that was written at the level of families, the parish churchgoer, um, people who were giving the vaccines. We also had to get good science. And so we were very fortunate to have help from the WHO, from Gates, Gavi, um, uh, you know, COVAX, all of those people to be in the and the International Pharmaceutical Association. So we put together this resource kit that was a clinical and ethical guide. And it was written, parts of it were written at the level of the parish priest or the bishop or the school principal or the head of social services. Parts were written at the level of the family. And it was it was set up so you could use pieces of it. For instance, to take the family guide, you could, it's only two pages, but it was questions and answers, very simply explained with pictures of children from every continent, not children that look like New York and Paris. And um, so we were very careful to do that. And then we translated it into nine languages and we had the money to do dialects and and, and, and then did some dialects. It's up on the, uh, the um, website of the, uh, the dicastery for integral human development. And we've said anybody that wants to copy it and improve it, do whatever you want. But we wanted it so that you could print and, and then we had the money to give to people to print it. So you could put a copy in the parish bulletin. You give every child in the school a copy. You could give it to anybody that came to the clinic so they could take it home, reread it, very simple language. So we knew information was going to be key. Then we also knew, as I said earlier, that we needed people to convey that information who were trusted. Um, we looked at the options we had, quite frankly, and having been a sister for a long time, I knew how you could mobilize this crowd. And so we went after religious communities in every country. Um, it was truthfully, um, like eating an elephant one bite at a time because most of them were as consumed as Father Stan talked about with trying to meet the um, oxygen. We, we don't have oxygen for people. We can't, you know, we've got three people in a bed and, and you want me to do something about 
teaching people. And, and so we worked hard. We had a lot of help from the Hilton Foundation and other foundations like GHR. Um, but we decided we would develop sister ambassadors. And for instance, in Africa, we had this, we have four countries that have really vibrant ones going, um, and Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, and Uganda. And we have, we're working with Tanzania now, and we're working with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We have 14 states in India. And a lot of places, like early on, India didn't have much COVID. Early on, neither did Africa. Um, and so this suddenly came up. The sisters in Africa would talk about nobody wants it for all the reasons Father Stan said. You know, it's a, we, on, a, on top of the fact that Western medicine doesn't have a good reputation at times in some of these countries. Um, and so one of the older sisters said, I decided that I'm old and I should go ahead and try to get this vaccine and show them. And so she got it, but she said every day, somebody calls the convent and says, is she dead yet? Uh, you know, and it's that level of people and, and, and concern. So we worked diligently in a number of countries um, and we're working now with a huge piece of the Philippines. Brazil, as you know, for instance, is has the economics. They have, they have a public health system that should be the envy of the world in terms of vaccinating. And guess what? They have a political system that says there's no such thing as COVID. And so, you know, they had massive deaths before the public demanded. So all they really needed was good information to overcome all the misinformation. So the giving them the resource kit and the ability to get it out there, the sister ambassadors, we didn't have to worry about getting the vaccines because they could buy them having a, a central service. Not the case in Africa and India and the Philippines. But we developed these sister ambassador programs and um, it was incredible to hear their reports. And a, a couple of weeks ago, I got this gorgeous video in from Ghana. You had about a hundred children with posters and signs dancing to a song they wrote about it. And their parents are all standing around and the signs are saying, Mom and Dad, we need you. Get a vaccine. You know, wash your hands. It's okay. Wear a mask. It's only a pain for a little while. Yeah. And so, um, and hearing today from the sisters in the African countries again, and what we've heard from the sisters in India has just been incredible. And for most of the people that our sister ambassador network went after, they were not the people. Um, that would be most likely to get the vaccine first. They were, as Father Stan points out, the massive rural health network in India. Uh, clearly, Africa, the you know the very rural. And so, uh, you know, Saint Vincent de Paul, Megan, as you remember, said to the Daughters of Charity, "You may take care of anyone who's sick and needs you, provided the poor are served first. So here was the church going after those who would be served last. So I'll stop there. I, I could go on forever, but I'll try not to keep rattling on. Thank you so much. And it's um, it's really helpful to have. And this is this is um, this is why I was so glad when when you and when Kate said said yes to being on this panel, because I think it, it's particularly helpful to see how right. Things are both similar and different when you're looking at multinational, right? You're looking at it from many different places. Kate, what have you been finding with Partners in Health? Sure, and you know, that was such a clear overview, sister. And I, I don't want to duplicate any of the the um, exciting details that you shared. But I think building from what you sh what you shared, um, you know, we from day one. You know, it's been a year now since vaccines have, have been available in the US and started to be available in, in, in other settings. And, you know, back then, way back um, before even the vaccines um, became more widely available, we 
and a global coalition, including many of you, um, you know, came together and said, if we're truly going to democratize access to um, and, and have a health equity lens, we have to have access to uh, equitable access for all. And so the idea of COVAX as a platform to in, ensure that there were vaccine doses for all in a lot of ways was meant to encourage the reduce the reduction of hesitancy from day one but what's played out and and you know because we've added covax to a system that is set up you know it's designed to uh support those who have um you know more of a neoliberal um mindset then we've seen that um you know the access issue the issue of you might get one dose of a vaccine for your population and then if you're waiting for four months or eight months you lose all those individuals who were excited that first time around to get their first dose but they don't know when the second dose is going to come and they also as you know as a national government don't know is it going to be the same vaccine that I had the first time, or is it going to be a new vaccine? It makes it extremely hard if you're the head of a national um, vaccine program to plan because you're not in control. You're at the liberty of when doses are, you know, this artificial system of, of kind of scarcity that we created, which was the opposite of what was the, the goal of this whole initiative. So our our efforts on day one have been, okay, how do we ensure that the community health workers and the, the, the colleagues at the facilities, the health workers have all the information they can and how do we engage with our, um, you know, with our, who are the most trusted members in communities? Many times they're the religious leaders um, from all different faiths. And so we've done extensive outreach, um, both in the US and uh, throughout the world in each of the countries where we work to encourage people to come. But I think my message to all of us is that if we don't solve this, you know, this sharing of technology, the tech transfer piece so that every country and every continent can be maybe not every country immediately, but at least every continent can be producing mRNA vaccines, which should be the right of everyone on this planet. Um, we're not going to truly ever be able to combat all of the hesitancy because the misinformation is gonna continue until we actually get um, you know, the access issues figured out. So uh, I've seen at the, um, political level here in the US that there's quite an argument you know being set that we don't need to the US doesn't need to manufacture more vaccines there's enough doses in the world um, people can't can't get them distributed quick enough and we need to stop uh, you know, we need to turn that argument upside down and really say, well, there might be enough vaccines on order, but as you're saying, Father Stan, you haven't had access to the mRNA doses from, you know, the big pharma companies yet because they haven't, um, you know, we've created this order of a list of countries that had to fight over who was going to get access. Um, and so I would say that while we still have work to do to fight hesitancy, we also really need to be fighting. You know, the the U.S. in May of this year said that we supported the i the idea of a TRIPS waiver of uh, for intellectual property to make the vaccine technology available so that other companies and other um, you know in South Africa and in Rwanda and in Senegal could start producing. But still, to this day, at the WTO, that has not been, uh, we, as the US government, have not pushed it further, and a number of the European countries are still blocking it, because we're taking, um, the, the pharma companies have us, you know, really in their control, and I'm saying that, you know, with a science mind and, and an equity lens to say that this needs to be our fight. We thought as activists back in May that we had, it was gonna quickly come and we were gonna be able to see that change. But here we are almost in the next year, 
um, without any change. So I, I would say it needs to be a multi-pronged approach and we have to be tackling it at the highest levels while simultaneously doing the really important community work with the sister ambassadors and you know people to people walking down the street, getting um, you know the right information out there. Thank you. Yeah, the I read an article this week um, or last week that talked about a South African company doing their own research to try and replicate Moderna because they're not be right because they're refusing the, the the waiver, and I know and it, I mean the two things that really really just made me both furious and and sad is furious because. Right, they have the infrastructure. They have the ability to to make um, the vaccine, and we've um, we've seen over the course of the last week with Omicron the way in which politics has been used to and and the way media coverage attacks what is a scientifically sophisticated operation um, in South Africa and and the scientists that are are right prioritizing global health over, well, we don't want to be the first ones to speak about this new variant we've discovered, right? To have it come out that, no, 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 there were known cases in Europe that were not made public, but it's the public health officials in South Africa, right? And then they get targeted as if, um, as opposed to the fact that they're the ones ac acting on behalf of equity and sharing of information. Um, and I'm wondering, Stan, to what extent this plays out um, in India and whether or not the domestic production angle changes questions of hesitancy and, and trust in a local population. I mean, India has a robust pharmaceutical industry that's often been at the forefront of pushing back against, um, uh, against some other Western controlled um, companies and patents. Um, and yet, at the same time, access in India has been um, has been so so low, and it looks like it's it's only in recent weeks that um, or recent months that an Indian pharmaceutical company has released for approval or gotten approval for an mRNA vaccine. I think it's called Zycovid, or, or yeah, there's a D yeah, a acronym, <laughs> which would require three doses. Um, which scientifically, I wonder if because it's coming out later, it's already got the booster built in to the sequence as opposed to the way Moderna and Pfizer were launched. Um, but do you seeing any? Do you see uh, you talked a little bit about some vaccine hesitancy does. Um, do you think that access is better than it would have been if you did not have. A locally produced pharmaceutical industry. Do you think that people, once there's more vaccine available in India, are people more likely to take something made in India than something made in the United States or China or Europe? Uh, it's the other way. Uh, for COVID shield, about 70 80% of Indians have taken COVID shield because it comes from AstraZeneca from, uh, from England. Whereas Indian made co co coaxin is there, and only when 15, 20%. And then from Sputnik, a few thousand people have taken one of them is me. <laughs> so in that sense, um, so we didn't have many people. So made in India is, doesn't necessarily mean that people will go after that. Uh, but uh, what uh, fascinates me is the same people, not only in India, but all over the world, when it comes to uh, polio vaccine for all other vaccines, Without any hesitation, all are lining up and even ready to pay from their pockets. I think when it comes to this one, COVID, it is heavily politicized and polarizing. In parliament, they are discussing and fighting with each other. You are the ones who are increasing this hesitancy and you are spreading these rumors. So both parties are telling each other. It's not only in the US. In every place, I think this is the first time a vaccine has been politicized and polarized and we have too much information and too little information. And then there is a trust deficiency. People don't believe. Whereas a polio, we have we have almost eradicated polio, but 
from 80s, 90s, for last 30, 40 years, how same people have accepted the vaccines that the government has been providing, lining up day by day, week after week, and then we managed to eradicate, uh, for example, polio and then many, many smallpox and all those things. But and there was a time for them. We had an experience of suffering and then finally this is a relief. Whereas this is, it came so fast in a quick way, quick succession. So we got the sickness and then the vaccine a few months so people don't believe. So that may be the time factor. But this, the political discourse, I think, has played a very big role. It's not the ignorance and the superstition and then the backwardness of the people. The same people, if they can line up for some other vaccine, why not for this? So I think there is a, a huge discourse that confused mixing mixed messages come from different uh, uh, angles. And then they, so it's almost pulling each other. So people don't pay enough attention. And then sometimes it is because of its expense and uh, various reasons. But we have the usual other things like rural urban and then a lot of poor people in Delhi. For every hundred men who received the vaccine, only about, I think, uh, 65 women. Simply women are invisible. Women don't, women don't go to receive vaccine. And then some people don't go there to their houses to, uh, to vaccinate them. So same, it's that, that much kind of a gender uh, disparities will remain. Uh, rural urban disparities will remain. And then we have millions of vaccines simply staying in the godowns in India, in many, many places. And government has permitted 25% of the production, they can sell them for private factor, private uh, agencies within the country. So from both, uh, from Pune Serum and Hyderabad, Covaxin and all these, uh, they can, private people have bought 25% of the production material, but only 4% of the Indians have received from private agents. So they, are, they have voted up. 25% of the production is in the private hands and they thought all these middle class and the rich will go to line up and get from them. People are not going there. They are all waiting for the free one that comes from the government. So the government has provided freely. So 94, 96% of the people are getting the free shots, even though they are rich and wealthy, rather than getting from the poor, from the private, uh, private companies. And then they have hoarded. They don't know what to do now. They have millions and millions and millions of shots with them. So that's again, they are, they, that's why now the government permitted them, November 26th, I think. So now they can export uh, to the middle and lower income countries, uh, both uh, from Hyderabad and from Pune. Covishield and Covaxin, both are being exported and then they are going to produce and Sputnik is being produced in Hyderabad itself. And then, so they are going to be more production from India besides taking care of India's needs. So the, the reason why people are uh, uh, delaying or uninterested or, uh, could be many, many reasons. I think political discourse is huge. Simply, uh, people, half of the people in a village are against each other because of political reasons. So they are, they, they are going with their, their political party is for vaccine or against vaccine. It's not only in US. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Uh, the political influence of the, the cultural factors and political factors. It didn't happen in, in other cases. Well, we talked uh, uh, about how it, right, the key to in order to a successful vaccination program is that the information is coming from a trusted source. And right, the flip side of that is that in a lot of cases, the misinformation and is coming from, you know, whether they should be trusted or not, sources that that people people trust um and that i mean we've certainly seen um that play out in the united states and and in cases and i don't know if this is true in other countries but i suspect it likely is is that in the united states we have a number of of these individuals who themselves we right are end up right being vaccinated but they haven't told anybody Right, the the most um, public case being that, of course, the president and first lady, President Trump and Melania Trump were vaccinated, but they weren't right in office, but it was not, that was not part of a press release, nobody was told, it was only quietly admitted to after. Um, and you think, and so, and, and we've seen that with, with some of the and we've seen the effects with with church leaders 
where what people say and what they do are not necessarily the same thing. Um, and it, it would be a question for a different um, a different day, but I, I wonder um, if one look back at the history, right, that, that new vaccines and new pet, right, have, there's been resistance at every stage going back in history, but this is the first time we're having this with this kind of globalized social media and the impact that, that I think that ends up having um, is, is just remarkable. Um, in particular for um, Sister Carol and, and Father Stan, although not to exclude you, Kate, one person put in the Q&A asking um, what you do or how you handle, and this would if equally be a question for people on the ground and partners in health, when amidst that resistance, people simply say, well, you know, it's in God's hands if, if I live or die from COVID. I don't need the vaccine. Well, it's in God's hands, whether you live or die one way or the other. So, you know, just let's just start there. But you do try to drink clean water. You do try to eat nutritious meals. Um, you've, you have you know, some of this is nonsense because these people that I don't take this, I don't take that. And, and, and you know, then some that don't take it because of the, of abortion thing or whatever, but well, for whatever reason, you look at them, they've been vaccinated against pneumonia, shingles, polio. I mean, you just tetanus, every, you just go on and on and on. Uh, and then, you know, the irritation that you're not a, how dare a country say I had to be vaccinated to come in. You say, wait a minute, I carry around my yellow card in my passport. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, I, I think, there was a funny old joke about uh, this guy was going to drown because it was flooded. And he said, oh, God, will take care of me. God, you promised you'd take care of me. So a boat came to say, come on, get in. I'll, I'll take you back. Nope, thank you. Helicopter came. Nope, thank you. Uh, field boat came. Nope, thank you. And then he drowns and says to God, what happened? You were going to take care of me. He said, I sent you three chances. And so, you know, I mean, you it's 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 just nonsense not to not to do the things that God has put at our disposal to help us, whether it's food, clean air, clean water, you know, healthy living, vaccines, those are gifts from God. And as Pope Francis said, it's an act of charity to yourself and to your family and to society to take those vaccines. Um, we have a more strategic question in the Q&A um, from another of the theology professors at St. John's. Do you have suggestions for how to effectively pressure the Biden administration and the WTO to shift their positions on the intellectual property waivers and technology transfer to the global south? Is lobbying politicians a waste of time? Will this require more disruptive direct action organizing? What do you, what suggestions do you have for things that might be effective? I can jump in quickly on that one, um, but I'd love to hear others' thoughts as well. Um, it's it's a great question, and I think, you know, I can share from from personal perspective. There's a ton of Congress members and others who've been you know, on press conferences with us, holding hearings, you know, speaking out um, for over a year now, and we've not yet reached um, the areas that we need, you know, the, the decisions that we need. And so, you know, we're, we're um, as a coalition of partners, really thinking that we need to have a big movement like there happened, you know, during the AIDS movement where there was more of those direct actions. We've started, you've seen a few over the last few months, um, a press conference staged outside of the home of the Moderna CEO in, in Cambridge, um, a uh, a pile of bones outside of Ron Klein's house saying, the, you know, representing the number of people have died waiting for vaccines. Um, and, and those have gotten 
public, you know, mass media attention more than any of our other press conferences and more official meetings with White House officials. And so I'm not trying to say that it's a, um, you know, only take the direct action route, but I think we're getting to a place where we're recognizing that this administration responds to the media and we need, we need it to not only be a US based effort, but we need individuals doing direct action in each of the European Union countries and the countries that are still holding out and not doing this, um, uh, you know, sitting at the table and actually writing the negotiations. We might agree in principle, but we're still blocking it because we're not at the table with the writing of the negotiations. So that's my personal opinion based on days and days of of work. And um, I will admit that there are more direct actions uh, being planned by a coalition of partners that I hope will continue to put pressure, but I hope we can get more, um, uh, you know, kind of spontaneous engagement across the world. Thank you. Sister Carol, you know, uh, want to add anything? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I would say um, building on what Kate said, um, one of the things, and I think we've got to look at the fact that we haven't made as much progress in the European Union, but we all need to be to face the reality in the United States and certainly in many of the other Western countries. The biggest uh, donator to um, political causes is pharma. Don't ever lose sight of that. You know, it used to be cigarettes, used to be NRA, but, and, and so you can make progress. But the other thing is, is sometimes I think we need to look at, and Father Stan pointed out the people that made so much money off this. Um, and, you know, India is the biggest manufacturer of vaccines, but all of India's vaccines were going out of India. Um, and, and, you know, part of that was uh, uh, early on, India didn't have as many cases identified, but part of it was the enormous profit that could be made. And, and so we need to, to, to um, look at and to highlight the real competence of that South African place, of the, the competence of the Indians who, I mean, we take their vaccines for everything else why could they not make this vaccine? I, I think we need to sort of go after the, the false obstacles that people put to this and say, yes, you know, maybe, maybe using the mRNA vaccine and manufacturing it is different from the polio vaccine. Okay, yes, it is. But we learned to make polio vaccine, we can learn to make mRNA vaccine, and we should highlight the competence of the places that are doing it so well. And and because we've gotta we've gotta push down, because nobody wants a vaccine that's kind of iffy. I mean, I hear that all the time talking to the sister ambassadors in various countries. They'll say, oh, we don't want to, I can't talk them into taking Sputnik. I can't talk them into taking um, some of the other, the Chinese vaccine, I forget Sinax or something. Um, they're waiting for Pfizer to come. And so I think we, we need to keep up the pressure, but also look at the, the false obstacles that get raised and highlight the competence where it's really there and where it's not there, demand that we help to develop it. Well, and, and um... Dr. Kim, who's one of our science professors, um, put in the the Q and A that, you know, we we have to be honest about the fact that you know Moderna's actively combating, fighting for their patents, and you know Moderna, and you know you all can um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Moderna, unlike Pfizer, took public money in order to 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 do this, in order to get. Um, to get it into production and get it and and get the vaccine done. And yet we constantly hear how President Biden has no power or control in order to right get them to work against the the patent. And you know there was a point at which Oxford wanted its vaccine AstraZeneca to be open access. Um and it's my understanding that um um 
that Bill Gates himself um, advocated against that and was part of of stopping it. And so it, um, for for in our final um, few minutes, well, I I know there's one more question coming in from the the audience that I, I want to try and get. Um, I want to get your thoughts on how you think this is. Um, that this is revealing that we need to think differently about healthcare and all of this in terms of commodity versus um, care and and the basic human rights of of peoples, um, because it also raises for me behind all of this is a lot of these ideas about what is or isn't appropriate or cost effective care to be delivered throughout the global south and to be a priority of 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 nations um in africa asia um in particular and so is this a moment where if these direct actions work if and uh, you know perhaps this is why moderna is so afraid where we might be at a watershed where we can finally push better access um and the making of Right, because for for real development to reduce the dependency, we need medicines and vaccines to be made in South Africa and Rwanda and Senegal, in addition to India, Brazil and the West. Um, do you think that this might be a moment where we we do have a shift kind of in the way that, quite frankly, when the AIDS crisis got really bad, right? It, it did involve a fi finally a shift because out of direct action that changed what was or wasn't seen as possible. What, am I being too hopeful? What do, you, what do the three of you think? Can I come for a minute? Maybe a few seconds. Yeah, thank you. Uh, once Sai Nath, an Indian agro scientist, he said, this is like uh, a surgeon who provided an autopsy of our society. And so it has exposed what is wrong with us. So it is not the uh, system that uh, kills. It is the economic systems that are there, like, you know, it is not the virus that is, it, the virus has no agency, it has no mind, it's simply there. But the society that we have become, especially with the neoliberalization liberalization of policies and capitalism. So in that sense, so he proposes, we should have a framework of justice. So uh, human rights, health as a human right and health justice and food justice and all that. And it seems now when I was reading something, uh, G20, they accumulate almost 80% of the vaccines produced. 80%, 79, 80% of the vaccines are hoarded by G20, more or less the wealthy countries. Now, I think uh, Omicron is going to be a game changer. South Africa, or whatever, wherever it was uh, created, it reminds, you are not safe as long as you share your vaccines with us. As long as non-vaccinated people are there anywhere in the world, you are not safe. So either you better give us, otherwise you will be prepared for more and more mutations. I think that's going to be a self, out of self-interest, I think we should go for a justice framework where we will have to share. It's holding here is no use and someone else it can always come and it will get us back. So in that sense, uh, maybe we will have a game changer with this new and it's going to be threatening at least if not uh, detrimental. I think that that will change some in some way. And uh, especially from WHO saying that no, we are going to be saved together or nobody will be saved. So nobody is safe until all of us are vaccinated. Well, I think that's going to be an interesting uh, argument to push. Kate or Sister Carol? Sure, I can jump in quick and then I'll let Sister Carol wrap us up. Um, I couldn't agree more that, um, you know, we we have to use this momentum in this, mo this moment, um, you know, we, uh, Every every effort that I've been a part of these last few decades of, you know, trying to bend the arc towards justice has, you know, continued to have forces that are very powerful trying to keep the status quo as it is. And if we don't, you know, look at this as a collective all of society effort of really, um, you know, that 
the linkage between the intersections of climate justice and health justice and social justice, like for care um, and 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 jobs. I don't think we're truly going to, um, you know, really be able to, um, you know, coexist in the 21st century. You know, a lot of our policies that were created at the founding of the UN, you know, over 70 years ago came at such a different time where, you know, there was the colonized and the and the um, the free world. And, you know, we're at a moment where that's still the case, even though on paper, um, you know, we've decolonized. So I, you know, I am very hopeful that, um, you know, we we can do this, but it's going to take a concerted effort of all of us who care about, you know, these these intersecting justice movements to say, um, this is enough, and we've got to reimagine kind of our 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 um, social contracts to each other. And so I I am going to you know we at PIH are going to continue to push for that, you know, with the lens of global vaccine access, but also in terms of you know how do we just continue to democratize access to to care as a right. You know, I think Father Sand hit it, and it, it, it is going to be a game changer, and we're going to have to, you know, we're going to look at the fact that if you want the economy to go the way you want it to go, you want security to go, you want the world to, to flow around, whether it's because you want to go to Tanzania for a vacation or whether it's the economics of it, we're not safe until all of us are safe. And we can start with that. But we in the church, and I think this is again Pope Francis and Fratelli Tutti, is to say, yes, that's true in, your, in our most base instincts, but we're better than our most base instincts. Build on that. Build on making neighbors of each other. Because if we do that in security and in economy and ecology, ah, uh, you know, and it, it, the world could be such a better place. And it really isn't going to detract from me if my neighbor gets a vaccine or if they have clean drinking water. And actually it will it will it will add to my well-being if drinking water around the world is okay. So um, I think while we may start at the at the at the most base instinct of I'm not safe if I don't give her a vaccine, the church's role is always to raise us above that. And I think uh, seeing how hard we work to help people often gives us a voice to say that. So I thank you very much for the chance to be with you. Thank you so much to all three of you uh, for this wonderful conversation. Um, and it it truly is wonderful to be able to talk with and learn from all three of you. Um, and I think I think that is where we are, right? Let's let's start with justice and let's use that as a starting point to to really build a community of solidarity and accompaniment. Um, and you know the work that all three of you do give us um, quite a vision and path from which to do that. Um, I thank everyone who came and I thank everyone who will watch this on YouTube. Um, I am a Catholic theologian, so we tend to answer things with both and. So in addition to keeping your eye out, I know I will for direct action going on um, in New York and other places for vaccine access and against the patents. Um, I also have put in the chat information that helps you lobby at your congressional representatives put together by Catholic Relief Services to pressure them um, in both ways. And thank you all for joining and thank you to the panel and happy Advent everyone. <laughs>